David L. Eulen. I'm the book's editor of Alta Journal. Welcome to uh, the California Book Club. Um, we tonight's uh, California Book Club celebrant is Natalie Diaz. <clears throat> for her, uh, we're, uh, she and John Freeman will be talking about her uh, Pulitzer Prize-winning collection of poetry, Postcolonial Love Song. Before we get to the interview. I just want to do a little housekeeping. Um, for those of you who don't yet know about the California Book Club uh, or Alta, um, Alta is a quarterly print journal with a, a, a pretty robust online um, component as well, covering sort of the arts, culture, literature, history of California and the West. Um, and California Book Club is a monthly um, a monthly gathering. Um, we we uh, have a committee that selects a book a month, um, California books, California writers. The writers come and um, talk with the California Book Club host, John Freeman. Um, so thank you all for coming. And if you've been here before, thank you for coming back. And if this is your first time, uh, we hope to see you um, again. I want to say that uh, first, I want to um, I, I want to introduce or, or thank our partners. We couldn't do it without them. Our partners on the California Book Club include Book Passage, Books Inc., Book Soup, Book Shop, Diesel, a bookstore. There goes my Zoom lid. I knew that was going to happen. Um, the Huntington USA, USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Ziziva, and Broman's Bookstore. I also want to let you all know that there is a sale for California Book Club members for $50. You can get a year of Alta Journal, the California Book Club tote bag, which is this um, lovely tote bag, Velcro pockets, all the things you need. Uh, and one of our upcoming California Book Club books. It's a, it, it's a great deal. So watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link. Um, and we have a ton of great coverage around tonight's author and book, uh, as we do around all of the books that we um, that we talk about in the California Book Club. So please visit the Cal visit CaliforniaBookClub.com to read essays and excerpts, all centered around postcolonial uh, love poem. Um, and now, enough of me. Without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to John Freeman, um, who will be talking to Natalie. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everybody. Um, happy Thursday. It's really nice to be back here with everyone. Um, when we put together this book club, one of the things that we all did in our first conversation was throw out names of, of titles and, and writers that we all loved. And, and um, Natalie Diaz's first book came up right away uh, when my brother was an Aztec. I've given this book to uh, probably more friends than I actually have um, because some of them haven't given it back. Uh, and partly because uh, it's such a beautiful book. It has a stunning variety of forms from lyrics to absidarians, um, has this wonderful long line in many of the poems, which you don't see managed as well as, as Natalie Diaz does. Um, plus it also foregrounds a, a sibling relationship, um, a sister's trying to rescue her brother from uh, from an addiction that she can't stop. Um, and it's, it's something that I think uh, all sorts of readers have dealt with in one form or other, trying to uh, rescue a sibling or someone that you love from something you can't stop. Um, and the book is exquisite, um, powerful. It's a personal and cultural mythology. And in the middle of it, there is an astonishing love poem um, in the middle of this war that's going on uh, in a household. Uh, that book was uh, published almost nine years ago. Um, and I think in um, poetry circles, Natalie Diaz's second book was kind of the, I don't know what to describe it as. Um, it was the book that everyone was waiting for, probably Natalie Diaz herself too. Um, and at last it's here, I have, I'm in London, so I have this beautiful UK edition um, and if when my brother was an Aztec is a is a book about hunger in some ways, um, a longing to be whole together with a family, to sit down at a meal um, and not have it go awry. This is a very thirsty book. It's a it's a book about love, um, but it's also a book about a post colonial condition of love, as in how do you write from uh, colonized language um, towards another colonized body if you're in love with it. Um, from a colonized body, uh, what sort of 
metaphors can you even begin to use um, without suddenly being into a hall of mirrors of what it means to be uh, a beloved or a lover. Uh, this is an exquisite collection of poems. Um, as in Natalie's first book, it's funny. Um, it's got wonderful bits of basketball, but it's also a clinic in language and studying how you can use a colonized language to see around to some degree its condition or to see through it. Uh, Natalie Diaz, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please join me on the California Book Club. Hi, gracias for having me, John. Uh, gracias also to David and Blaze and Beth and um, yeah, and I think, is it your, are you at 1 a.m. right now, John? I'm always on California time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> that was a good line. <laughs> um but yeah, no, it's always it's always my luck to uh to be talking with you. Um and I think what was really beautiful about uh, uh joining the Alta uh community is it, it's very much the way I think that you've handled my book and my work and so many of our books and works as I you know from uh, from Sweden to Italy to these many other places, like you've carried my work um, with such generosity. So uh, yeah, so it's been great to to, to join this Alta crew here and um, all of the different writers who are willing to engage the work and just made a real uh, field of the work. And so uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, we've had some wonderful essays and <clears throat> well, you've, um, I, let's start in that collaboration. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think of poets as sitting on a sort of mountain fastness, you know, um, you know stroking their chin, thinking <laughs> difficulty <laughs> about language and love. But, um, you know, the, the, the end notes of this book are full of notes about collaboration from the poems you ripped back and forth as letters with Ada Limon um, to the places where you wrote some of these poems to the early readers. I, I, I guess I would like to talk to you about um, what collaboration means to you as a poet um, and and how, you know, that came to be your way of thinking about writing, because um, it's it, it's not always obvious. Yeah, I part of it, I think, is built into me in in many ways, like um, a lexicon that maybe is pre verbal and that I'm from a very large family. So, you know, um, my parents had 11 kids and we were in a very small small area two bedroom house so um you know in some ways that is uh collaboration whether or not i, I chose it uh, it's kind of a collaboration that happens to you um and i think which again like built me toward toward basketball um living on a reservation where your neighbors were your family um where you know we were kind of collectively responsible for a lot of our individual mistakes um, in some ways. And so I think that that's a part of it. I, I think also poetry itself, I, I do believe is a field of collaboration. I think, um, you know, when you read, when you find the writers you love, they are alongside you. You'll never let them go. Um, or they will never leave you maybe. Uh, you know, I, I often find myself writing lines and I think like, you know, sometimes I'll like look at lines and I'll think, what 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 have I been reading? And and wonder like how those lines have grown like or thorned or bloomed from some of these works. I, you know, I've been reading Ceylon a lot. I came so late to Paul Ceylon and uh, my friend Christian Campbell introduced uh, their work to me in a much more um, immersive way because they're doing an event with us. And so I just started reading and reading and spending time in letters and and you know you can't help but uh but want more of language or you can't help but show up differently to language after you read someone like Ceylon and so I think already poetry is is collaborative whether we realize it or not I think I think to our detriment sometimes we feel like we're coming to the page alone I feel quite lucky in that I don't I don't, I, I feel very lonely. I mean, I'm lonely a lot, a little depressive, but lonely a lot. But, but, but I feel like I'm always with folks when I come to the page. Um, and, you know, I think toward, toward the people I love who are poets and who are writers. And, you know, it, 
it's quite lucky to think that I'm writing things that they might read, you know, or yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not different than basketball, right? Um, Roger Reeves used to always be like, you know, like, like who'd be your starting five, you know, like who's your start, you know, and, but I, th I think that way a lot. Um, so yeah, so collaboration for me is, it's natural. It's a way I think, I think better alongside, or even, you know, mostly against, you know, I'm one of those, it's like, let me just, it's like basketball. I need to press up against these, these wonders and these possibilities to understand like wh how my own body exists or moves or bends or gives because of that. So, you know, to collaborate with other writers or artists, um, yeah, that's, it feels, it feels natural to me and it feels like I'm, I'm my best and my most so much more than I would be if I, if I was standing on my own. Mm. Um, I'm going to repeat some of Natalie's, um, biography throughout this interview so forgive me natalie for telling you um things which you <laughs> have already lived and please correct me if i get it wrong i hope you do it better than i did the first time <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah well i think we all feel that way about a lot of things <laughs> but um as, as natalie was speaking um it's useful for those of you who don't know uh that she uh was a, a point guard um playing basketball growing up um, uh, for Old Dominion. Um, you know, their team went to the final four your freshman year and then the final 16 the following three years and you played professional basketball. And if any position on the court uh, needs to see the whole court and the whole, the dynamics of motion um, of everyone, it has to be the, the point guard. And as you were speaking, I was so struck by the fact that you were using images and metaphors that are completely, um, braided through all of your work, um, whether it's sort of the, uh, you know, the, the idea of a field of space, um, you know, the, the sort of cosmological sense of language. Um, and you, you know, you said the word lonely, uh, which is one of my favorite lines of, of there's many of them in this, this book, post-colonial love poem is, um, let me be lonely, but please don't let me be invisible. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about one metaphor that comes up in post-colonial um, love poem, which is thirst. Um, there's th this, we could, we could talk about so many different words. And that's what's so great about this book is it's, it's braided so, so beautifully together. Um, snakes come up as, as, uh, as, <laughs> as, as, as I was pointed out in one of the essays, um, but thirst is something that I have not uh, felt um, addressed in in poetry and in love poetry in quite such a um, total way and I wonder if you can talk about that as a, as an orienting metaphor for this collection and if you found that it was something arising naturally or, and and you helped it along or if it was something that you del deliberately placed across the poems yeah I I talk and work and move a lot in lexicons like uh, so I th language for me is quite physical so I feel like I'm always like touching it or it's it's moving me and so there are words that I I carry and sometimes I can feel myself sometimes letting words go or other times holding them and refusing to or just continuing to turn them over you know it's like almost like you want to disc the field of that word and see what grows errantly that you didn't know was there but also to tend what you think might be there um thirst is i mean thirst just as a word itself is i think is very uh it's, it's so interesting it's it's from like i think it's from like a verb uh, that has to do with drying and yet it is also a desire so it i always think like you know which way does desire work does it only work against or does it work through and so thinking like it breaking down the word itself but also uh, you know Growing up in the desert, I think there's a way that uh, we have certain sensualities and it's easy to have these umbrella sensualities, you know, sadness, like, you know, loneliness, even even something like hunger or thirst. And if you've ever been thirsty or if you've ever been hungry, then, you know, and, and I, I know even my my experiences with those have not been as drastic as, you know, others. But I think like something that happens in the desert it, if you, you know, if you're willing to look, uh, and by look, I mean, like with your body, is it's a, it's a pretty 
brutal place as much as it is an abundant place. And one of its abundances is thirst. And, mm. and, and part of thirst implies like satiation, like part of, you know, thirst is, it's one of those funny places. Like it, it's reminds me of the ecstatic, like you can almost plug it in. So, so where does it happen? Is it happening in the body? Is it just outside? Is it that moment, you know, of desire that's like, because you know, touch is going to come or, you know, water is going to, to come. And so for me, it's, um, it's almost like an out of time, but that place between, you know, between where the body might yet be, but also the the condition the body is in right now, this it's almost a momentum. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's all the politics that come with that. What what it means to to be of a, of and in and with a river uh, that is the most endangered river in the United States, or to watch um, the ways that our country uh, weaponizes water. You know, here I'm close to the U.S. Mexico border. I'm thinking of like Gaza, I'm thinking of Palestine, I'm thinking of all of these different places and you know, Central and South America where water has been weaponized. And and I think for me, thirst as well is um it's something we we all share and forget that we share, or I feel that way personally. I think, you know, and, and it shows in the ways that we don't protect water. And so I feel like it I feel like thirst is a place where we are we are going to collectively arrive together and it it is it's a place of um possibility because I do think it's something that will change us whether you know and and maybe in very terrible ways but but it's going to thirst is an, is a place we all might meet and become better alongside one another so there's a very intimate kind of desirous, which is sometimes just the kind of physical survival of a body, but sometimes it's desirous in the more like sexual sense. Um, but yeah, it's a place of sensual imagination, I think. And I, I can never quite pinpoint where it is, even though I know the way I feel it in my body. Um, but yeah, and then just back down to etymologically, it's such a strange word to me that it, that it, it, it means the dryness, but it also prom there's a promise or a dream of at least uh, the wetness that might, you know, satiate it. So, mm. yeah. So you grew up in the Fort Mojave Indian village in Needles on the bank of the Colorado River, which is the river that you're referring to that, that you grew up around. And, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time near the um, Russian River in Sacramento and others in when you live near a body of water, it, has, it changes every day, um, and those that mutability is is um, is thrilling and and alive. It feels alive in a way that when you say the word water, it doesn't necessarily always capture the fact that it is a presence in your life. And one of the things that this book breaks down is the idea that you are separate from landscape um, to some degree. That you, and 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 in particular. Um, you know, there's a line in this book that, you know, uh, that my body is a, is, is a river and I, that's not a metaphor. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit through that, um, the politics of that statement, um, what that means, um, but, you know, either, uh, you know, being from where you're from or um, uh, the erotics of it as well. Yeah, that's a lucky question, John. Um... And I mean, you must also have these experiences because you travel so much. I think of the places you travel and what water means in those places, what land means in those places. And then and then language, right? That, like, I feel like if anyone knows some of what I, I'm trying to express in language, it would be you and that like the way the language is shaped by the land and the water and, and what that means of people's relationality in all of these different places that you move. And then the fact that you're often carrying poetry into those places. I think I think in some ways like that feels maybe one of the closest conversations I've been in about something like this. Um, I think for me too, the metaphor, I think sometimes we, it's like, you know, metaphor and simile, one thing is like an other. And, I mean, something that feels important to me is that that it, it it is all of of one, you know. And so, metaphor to me is is a 
I don't want to say necessarily a vehicle because I think it nails us to a kind of craft that that I try hard to uh, to to just skirt the outside of. But I think it really is about sensuality, and and sensuality is in some ways the imagination. You know, I love asking my like I love trying to just in my own body think like as I'm imagining something like where is that happening? You know, it's kind of the whole thirst relationship. Like, where is it happening in me? And, you know, in some ways it's really lucky that I grew up in this place that has this very particular relationship to the river and to land and where we speak of one and the other the same way we might speak of each other. And so you learn care in a different way and you learn, I think you learn, you learn maybe both the immensity of your life and also the the smallness of it. And there's a phrase that I I talk about or I use a lot because I'm I feel like I I feel like I only understand it in some ways right now and I know as I get older I'll understand it more, but the idea of being of consequence. I think in some ways that might be how a metaphor operates for some folks on the page, but but to understand that that the, the language I use, the words I say, even even a poem, like everything I do is of consequence to what is around me. As much as others and their actions are of consequence to me, and whether that's the river or the land. And it it to me, it's a, you know, we say the word relationality a lot. It's like, it's almost like a buzzword these days. But I, but I think there's something, there's something of a desire there to to learn to be alongside. Um, and poetry is one of the few places where I can bring that, uh, not even an explanation, but where I can try to kind of, um, where I can try to seed what it might mean for me along the way. You know, poetry is a selfish a place for me. I don't think selfishness is a bad thing. Um, if you don't think about who it affects, I think then it becomes a bad thing. And I don't mean to imply I'm not also selfish in a way that I sometimes forget to to think of others around me. But I think poetry is a place for me to set that um, that that desire to to figure out what I you know, what is this if it's not a metaphor, you know, because it's one thing to grow up hearing like to say our name is to say the river is carried in the middle of our body. So I'm carrying it. I, I am responsible for it. I'm of consequence to it. It is of consequence to me. And then to have this, these very real, like, so if that seems something that's difficult for, for someone who's not raised in my language lexicon to understand, like, might, might you understand then what it could possibly mean to me if that river is gone and it is the very thing that I was raised of and I believe my body is of it. I, my belief system is shaped around it, and so I think maybe too that's why I say like you know I know some of the works you've done and some of the places you move, and I feel like there 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 are certain precarities there of you know that are beyond natural resources, but it's about the practices in which you engage the place and how you've built your life there and what your life becomes of beauty or or sorrow. In relationship to those lands and waters so i think i didn't quite answer the question but uh it is making me think a lot so uh well, pardon if i went uh hell not at all no, but, uh, <laughs> I, I love your dedication because you 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 use the word towards rather than to you know when you dedicate the book you i'm writing this book towards and you know i i feel like um the way that you speak and and to some degree the way that some of these more lyric essay like poems move is towards spaces and towards um, opening up and, and enlarging places where definitions might be shutting down um, both your possibility to, to exist or, or people's uh, possibility to themselves exist within complex landscapes and, com and complex identities and truths. Um, I wonder if you could read a poem now uh, from the book so that we could hear it because the, the sonics of the book are so gorgeous and um, and add a whole other layer that I think we can't even begin to describe except for just hearing it. Yeah, I, I'm gonna read from The Desire Field. You had mentioned Ada. So this poem was written uh, with, with and toward my friend, 
my friend Ada alongside her. Um, there were these kind of letters we were sending back and forth to one another, I think as a way to, to not write poems, uh, but to be in touch because we were both moving so moving around so much it was hard to it was not hard to keep track of one another, of course, like text is easy, but it was, I think, it was hard to locate ourselves in relationship to one another. And that felt important for us um, <clears throat> during that time. And I think this goes a little bit toward thinking about lexicon and like how to not make a simile or a metaphor, but to actually think of language as making us more possible or more capacious to, to withstand um, in this case, for me, it's anxiety. So, from the desire field, I don't call it sleep anymore. I'll risk losing something new instead, like you lost your rosin moon, shook it loose. But sometimes when I get my horns in a thing, a wonder, a grief, or a line of her, it is a sticky and ruined fruit to unfasten from despite my trembling. Let me call my anxiety desire, then. Let me call it a garden. Maybe this is what Lorca meant when he said, verde que te quiero verde. Because when the shade of night comes, I am a field of it, of any worry ready to flower in my chest. My mind in the dark is una bestia, unfocused, hot, and if not yoked to exhaustion beneath the hip and plow of my lover, then I am another night wandering the desire field, bewildered in its low green glow, belling the meadow between midnight and morning. Insomnia is like spring that way surprising and many petaled the kick and leap of gold grasshoppers at my brow i am struck in the witched hours of want i want her green life her inside me in a green hour i can't stop green vein in her throat green wing in my mouth green thorn in my eye i want her like a river goes bending green moving green moving Fast as that, this is how it happens. Soy una sonambula. And even though you said today you felt better, and it is so late in this poem, is it okay to be clear, to say, I don't feel good? To ask you to tell me a story about the sweet grass you planted and tell it again or again? Until I can smell its sweet smoke, leave this thrashed field and be smooth. And that was a really lucky poem. Uh, it, it, in a way, like I think people felt like uh, my first book had some of the most, I think people have used like the word vulnerable or the most forthright uh, uh, poems because the brother is so close to my real life brother. But this was the, this was the first poem that I uh, engaged like my own anxiety in a, a head-on sort of way in a way I never had before uh, of course still using you know the image and and some of the same like uh, um, moves that I that I often make with language but it was the first time where I I wrote about anxiety and I think some of that happened like because of this quote collaboration or because I, I was writing to someone who who I loved and who I knew loved me and that love was quite particular and so it it allowed me to one use a language I would use with with any beloved uh, but this poem kind of cracked that open and helped me like and helped me help me think and pressure myself and and really try to to invite myself to treat everybody in the book as a beloved and so Ada being a friend, I wanted to use language that I might use with my lover, that I might use with my mother, uh, and to see how tender I could be, which showed me also the tenderness I, I could have with myself, which is something that was harder to do in the first book, for example. So, uh, yeah, I know you didn't ask me to talk about it. It, it just popped in. Oh, I'm so glad you brought, brought this up because the 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 omnidirectional nature of love in this in this book um 
creates uh, a very charged field of language and possibilities uh, because um, uh, you know you, you're asking yourself as as the poet um, you know in many different scenarios why you know why can't I see th this as an act of love um, and uh, across the book um, as you're writing about landscape you're writing about landscape in the language of love and you're writing about a lover's body in the language of landscape um, and and so it it it's um I, I guess I wanted to ask you about well I writing about love uh, erotic love in that way um, uh, because it typically I think one of the <laughs> I, I don't, one of the things that I think that it makes um, sexual love hard to write about it is it is its deeply specific nature sometimes where you think oh my god I have to watch the poet have sex now um, and, <laughs> and <laughs> that, that never that uh, amazingly never happened yeah, reading like this <laughs> yeah. well it, 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 yeah and um, I think what what's so powerful about the book is it's um, is is you find all these different ways to write about uh, erotic love that that shake up language and and um, create the feelings and the the um, the intensities of erotics without um, the very tired images of it. And I, I guess that to me is one of the major breakthroughs of the book is is to read love poems that are deeply sensuous that feel completely new. And I, I wonder, did some of that come because you were addressing non-lovers in the language of love? Did, did some of it come because you just compressed and rewrote the poems a lot so that it, it scrubbed out any possible real life details or I'll never tell no I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um well I mean I think some of it does like as you're saying the landscape like you know it it's quite something to 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 feel so close so uh, I'm in I'm in Phoenix now, so I'm on Akamal Atham lands. It's one of my homelands. But I, I I grew up at Fort Mojave, so if I look north, I see our Creation Mountain. If I look south out my door, I see the place we go, Mojaves go when they you know leave this flesh body life and move into another. So I mean it, it's something, right? Because I mean there are so many stories. I mean the the Bible is like what are we made of like a rib and spit or something, you know, rib spit, some dirt. But I mean, to, to think like, that's the place we were made, we were made of clay, like, you know, life breathed into us. And so like to not imagine the body as still of that. So I think there's a mixture between that relationship to land and water. And also just the lexicon I have to the, like we all have a lexicon of body. Sometimes it's one of like shame. Sometimes it's one of, of medicine, you know, uh, God, there's, we all have so many lexicons of crisis or emergency of the body. I also have like a very different lexicon of the body because I played basketball, because I grew up in such a small, like small, like square footage with a bunch of people. And so, the body to me has always been many things, but never a body of, of shame, definitely a body of injury. You know, I, I, I've written about this before, but, and it's in my first book, like I, my, uh, you know, my great grandmother was my, one of my best friends and she was a double amputee. And I feel like I learned to love a body through her body and she had no legs. Um, and, and so like, you know, to touch her hip, to, to give her her insulin shots to to rub her legs when she had phantom phantom pain and and to think like she's asking me and I don't want to tell her no I don't know what to do and so I would rub I would just rub the sheets and and I and I, I was little then and I didn't even talk with my mother about it until I was like 12 or 14 you know like and so it was something I felt like was like this intimacy between me and my great grandmother and so I think there's something about just it feels it feels very lucky to me to to know my body in these ways like to to know that a a body can be so broken and it it has nothing to do with with beauty for me you know it, it's maybe more like the miracle of it or or the luck that whatever it is that dreams me at night or that I can imagine of something or that connects me to other people 
that it that it could be in this body you know i i was at um i was recently at the merwin conservancy and uh and so staying in in william's place and uh, i mean i'm sure most folks here know william passed uh, a few years ago and but to stay in those in in just in the middle of this forest like a, a true like palm forest or i don't know forest garden but every window is framed so that you, it's like this beautiful like almost like this moving painting um and i don't know if i should say this or not but i i will like so uh we we did a, a golden teacher mushrooms there also so there was a one day you i was like wow like i'm watching these palms and to think like you know to watch the way they move and to 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 uh learn of why well, i didn't learn learn the words themselves but to learn of and to read them and to hear them said all of the different words in in the Hawaiian language that talk about the way the palms move and to and to think like that's this is why I have this body like that palm tree came first and and however I happened whoever imagined me the whatever way you believe that the body began or happened it it I couldn't I can't help but think like are those hands are those lungs like i i am trying my best to do what these things do and to watch them move together it was almost like they were breathing for me um and not just with the golden teachers i mean it was every day that they were they were that but i but i think for me i think i think the body is just naturally erotic i think we it's definitely been like i mean it's literally been beaten out of some of us it's been like you know religioned out of us but what a lucky of all the things we could have been in that our lives could have manifested in like to have these bodies and i know all, we have ma many different sensualities and i know bodies get sick and they they are injured and wounded and yet i mean i can't think of anything luckier than touch you know like what a crazy thing or even like that the, the I think a lot about the the art we do because I think sometimes we don't think of 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 writing as like an art per se, but to think about like the tools we use, but, you know, for some of us, some of us that's a pen. For people who have different sensualities, they are maybe like making marks on the page differently, or with different technologies. But to to be able to make a mark that someone else might see and find some sort of legibility about themselves i don't know it's it's kind of crazy and i don't mean to like take it sideways but but i think for me that's part of how i think of the body that this body can make a poem that that still excites this body is is pretty incredible so uh i think i think erotic exists in so many more places than we allow it to mm. um you know it's like if you hold a friend like my mom we hold hands a lot in, in my family but that feels erotic to me, you know, like that is, I'm never more alive than when my mom's holding my hand, you know, like I'm never more myself. Suddenly you're like, this is what the hand, this had to be what the hand is for. Whereas I'm, I'm holding my lover's hand. It's like, this is what, you know, mm. could the hand have been meant for anything else? Or, you know, like small things, like we, we touch our faces or we talk with our, our hands. Um, and again, I know they're, they're, you know, they're, we all have different bodies and different sensualities with them. So I don't mean to over focus on the hands. However, for me, that is one of my main like sensual, like sensual engagements with the world is through my hands. Yeah, the ability to touch things is a miraculous thing. I mean, we could have, um, you know, not had that ability. And, um, you know, I want, I want to, talk a, a little bit about um color because this this book is saturated with lots of color um and one of the listeners has brought up the fact that you know the color green is used throughout the book and you know the, it's so difficult to define what a color is but it does do amazing work on the page um, and that it opens this field of of experience and emotion and, and i wonder if you can talk you know about using color in in um in this book in particular, if you had a kind of idea of what to do or if it just emerges naturally. 
Yeah, I, well, I mean, green is so magical, right? I and mean, you write about green, um, like, you know, the parks, uh, the archipelago of green, um, all the photos you take of the parks, right? Um, I mean, I think for me, green is, is several things. In, in poetry, green is very much Lorca. Mm -hmm. um, but I think color is also very much Borges. I, I think we think of Borges more in terms of his like fictions. I love his poetry, though. I love I think it's complex as hell, but but I just love spending time there. Um, you know, I think even like Ceylon, you know, the black but also for me, like, because I live in the desert and, and I think some of your folks that are especially based in CA and, and depending on how far out you get from the city, you know, color is not what, what they told us, right? Like there's the primary colors and then there's color. Um, and so I th and then also that, that we know color is, is about motion. It's, it's not really the thing itself. It's, it's our, again, our sensuality or relationship to whatever it is we think we are seeing. It's almost like color is almost a thing you absorb, right? Like I think, you know, we're absorbing it with our eyes or our eyes, it's happening in our bodies. Um, and then there, you know, there's science that says our, our skin can sense color, which I just think is so beautiful. Um, but, but for me, the green, of course, is, is very Lorca. Because I don't know, I mean, and John, I don't know what you think about this. I talk with my friends a lot about this, and Tomas Morin and I have talked about this for a long time. But verde que te quiero verde, I don't think that will ever be translated. Like, mm -hmm. you know, green, I want you green is, I feel like, so far from what, it, it's like the impossible. It's like putting putting words together that are almost nonsensical because you know, back to the whole Francis Bacon thing where it's like, how, how like, can I make this thing in the most irrational way? Like that kind of just like, you know, um, I, I'm saying ecstatic, but I, I think lately I need ecstatic to do more. So I, I, I'm using that as a kind of uh, 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 currency of, of maybe ease of understanding, but, but in the desert, and I mean, like I, I mentioned the, in the last poem, or no, I didn't, but the, the title poem, There Are Wildflowers in My Desert, which take up to 20 years to bloom. Like Californians know that. Like that's one of your sensualities. Uh, and, and it's even beyond us. It's a way that we know time, you know, and, and the patience, like that, that, that um, beyond patience, right? That it, it, it's outside of time. But here in my desert, uh, if it rains within an hour, you watch what the land does with the water and it is the one it's one of the most unbelievable things that like the greening happens and you think like this is how any body learned from this is how any human body learned what to do was from from this non-human life and and to watch what happens in our desert with a non-human life and how they move how they it's it's almost like we're it's like yep like here we go like charge you know everything comes everything happens um and and i think for me the desert keeps you i i mean it keeps you alert of course in so many ways but but it also keeps you uh a, like attentive and intentionally attentive you know because you're always reading for water you, you're reading the sky and you know from 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 more like uh traditional things like there'll be a, there's a certain way when the clouds hit our sky that my elders are like this something bad is happening you know versus like a, a uh something and that means like among us like an energy whereas you where i live you can see storms coming from two or three miles away you know and then we get like the santa anna's how wind the seasons of wind things like that but but the, but those greens for sure um but I love color and I it was one of my earlier relationships with language was color. Um, you know, I read every book on color I could find in the library. Some of the early, you know, like early books where people were trying to name all of the colors. And, um, you know, I love like going into paint stores and looking. I mean, I don't know. Color for me is it's such a verb of a thing and it's it shows it shows the impossibility 
and maybe all the things we don't know yet about what it is we're sensing, you know, with, with color. Um, yeah. So I think a lot about it. Uh, that's a long answer to, to the question or wonder, but I, I feel like, uh, color is is one of the most uh violent and disruptive and by that i don't i don't think violent and disruptive have to be you know horrible things but they are they cause they're they're happening maybe i'll say uh which feels yeah it always draws me draws me to it i love that poem skin light um because it feels like it's a kind of uh an attempt to formalize the issue that you're talking about, which is how do you how do you describe the world? You know, maybe if I put these two words together, it, it, it will get closer. And the whole poem is a sort of attempt to get closer and closer and it and it and it it ends up creating this amazingly musical sonic quality to the language, which achieves the feeling internally of the color. but it, it if you look at the words themselves, they've kind of left meaning behind and they're in some other trance-like state. And I, I think that's just so, so amazingly well done. Um, I would ask you to read it, but it's probably a little bit, um, it's about three pages. Do you, do you have another poem you could read us? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a few short ones. Um, I mean, there's another light poem too I could read. Um, I also love that one of your hyphens is um, Lake Glint, <laughs> which yeah. um, why do the paint stores not have Lake Glint? You know, <laughs> I know. I do my library in Lake Glint. <laughs> <laughs> a, a long light. I was thinking a lot about how light moves, and and again back back with touch, and I I think something that I realized early on is like that I'll, uh, you know, the way that I let the, the love poem come back into everything, or I imagine the movement. And then, uh, I mean, there was a way I almost like seek refuge in the poems in the possibility of love. Um, <clears throat> but this is, uh, I'll read this again about light. This is a Marfa poem, uh, you know, Marfa. And um, yeah, so I tried to put as much light as I could into the book. If I should come upon your house lonely in the West Texas desert, I will swing my lasso of headlights across your front porch. Let it drop like a rope of knotted light at your feet. While I put the car in park, you will tie and tighten the loop of light around your waist. And I will be there with the other end wrapped three times around my hips horned with loneliness. Reel me in across the glow-throbbing sea of green thread, blue stem, prickly poppy, the white inflorescence of yucca bells, up the dust-lit stairs into your arms. If you say to me, this is not your new house, but I am your new home, I will enter the door of your throat. Hang my last lariat in the hallway. Build my altar of best books on your bedside table. Turn the lamp on and off, on and off, on and off. I will lie down in you. Eat my meals at the red table of your heart. Each steaming bowl will be just right. I will eat it all up. Break all your chairs to pieces. If I try running off into the deep purpling scrub brush, you will remind me there is nowhere to go if you are already here and patch your hand on your lap lighted by the topazian lux of the moon through the window. Say, here, love, sit here. When I do, I will say, and here I still am. Until then, where are you? What is your address? I am hurting. I am riding the night on a full tank of gas, and my headlights are reaching out for something. I always think of that line, uh, build my altar of best books on your bedside table, because I think that's the curse of dating any writer slash reader is is like you suddenly realize, hmm, they're a little too comfortable. Like suddenly that table 
Yeah, it's not the, it's not once a guest table, you know, on the other side of your bed and suddenly all their books are there. So Yeah, it's not the toothbrush, it's the book pile. That, that. For sure. <laughs> and you know you're doomed then. That's lo that's love is when they're the book pile. <laughs> oh, I love that that poem so much. Um because it, it it does so many different things at once, but it uh, it, it also sometimes occasionally sounds like a like a kind of country western song in a in a <laughs> I felt that. Well, I used to ride that road. Just that's one of the things I did because in Marfa they give you the Prius to cruise. So I would just ride up and down. Listen, and there's like what two channels out there, and so I would just listen. And then they have a all the houses have a, a Leonard Cohen greatest hits and like a, oh shoot, they have a couple Woody Guthrie, a couple others. But I would just play those CDs and just drive, and I was just watching the rails like in the moonlight. And so I think in some ways, you know. Maybe now country songs aren't written that way, but that's how I would imagine the old ones having been written, you know. I feel like the the, the best country Western songs, and I'm not a, uh, necessarily a fan of the genre, but they, they produce a lonesome feeling that can be, that when you have it, it's not, um, lonely and lonesome to me are different things. Like lonesome is a kind of comforting loneliness, whereas lonely is something that you kind of want to abate to some degree. But a lonesome feeling while you're alone in a car driving can be a, a, a nice thing. I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, poetry is made over time alone usually, but sometimes in, in, in dialogue with other poets or sometimes even writing directly to them. And, you know, you, you've written very beautifully about how your, your body was built by basketball and how you're so grateful to basketball for what it made you um, as, as a person. Uh, I think of basketball as a very repetitious activity. Like in order to get good at it, in order to shoot a free throw, you have to go to a gym by yourself sometimes and just sit there and pick up your, your brick shots and go and shoot them again. And I, I, I wonder what that's, that kind of experience, though all those hours of doing the same thing over and over again, um, to some degree alone, what what that's made you as a as a writer and in, in, in terms of your capacity for repetition or um, tedium or <laughs> aloneness. Yeah, I mean you you have you have more than one brother, right? Or just two, two. Yeah, so so I feel like you you know this. I feel like that's also why you get some of the humor in my work is because I think you. I always because brothers, there's no there's no one who will break your heart but also crack you up like brothers, you know, um, but I think basketball is, uh, so I imagine you all played some games or whether they were like sports or other things where, where, where like, like for me, my family, like it, I was really close with my little brother. Um, and so we would be out playing games, but you would have thought there were like 10 people. It's like almost like you bring your like ghost friends, you know, and especially on the court, you know, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Betts and I talk about this a lot, like, uh, cause Earl the Pearl was like, uh, Earl the Pearl was uh, his, he, he, he talks about finding a, a, this encyclop sports encyclopedia in the library. And uh, he learned about Earl the Pearl. And so pretty soon he was trying like Earl the Pearl's move out in the court with his friends. He writes really beautifully about it. Um, but you know, when you're out on the court by yourself, you're kind of not, you know, like, yeah, there's the repetition, which is very much like sensual. So it's like, am I feeling, do I feel the ball in my hand or do I, do I hear it in my body? Like you kind of can't tell, like, is it touch? Is it resounding? And it's all of these things. If you're, you know, whether you're on like a, a really nice wooden court, which is, was rare for us growing up, but also like the chain, the chain link, the thud of like a cheap rim and like the concrete and, and never knowing where the, the the blacktop being broken, never knowing where the ball would go. But like, you know, and I would stay out till dark and I would be up before anyone else to try to beat the heat. But I was by myself, but not. There are all these imaginary people there, you know, because it's like, who who are you making this move from? Like, oh, you, and, and then you're cheering yourself. You're like shooting a fadeaway and you're sitting there like, oh, like cheering yourself and there's nobody there. Um, and so I think there's something about that. There, there's a There's a poem... I've been trying to write, but maybe there's a reason why I can't write it. And maybe it should stay this beautiful thing is uh, when we come to New York, we stay with a good friend of ours in in Harlem. And there's some kids that live at the corner. I mean, Harlem, 
still has its neighborhoods, right? Which feels so feels good to me. New York is hard for me, but when I find like little neighborhoods, they feel normal. Um, but there's these little kids who play, and we haven't been in a couple of years, so they, I mean, they are probably moving through their teens now, but, you know, like, you hear them playing at night, and they're like, oh, pass the ball, oh, blocked you, like, oh, three, LeBron James, you know, like, they'll bring Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan back, and they don't have a ball. Like, they're out there in the street with no ball playing, and like, you know, I try not to like creep on them. So we, but when we look through the window and like you can see them because they're a couple brownstones down, but like you see them and and they're like moving around and like it's like they're dancing because you can't really. There's no ball, you know, and it's one of it's one of the most like amazing things I think I've I've ever seen. And and maybe that's why it should never it should never be ruined by by me writing about it. But but yeah, I think there's something about that. Um, and about like what repetition can mean. Uh, when I talk, when I do talks about repetition, I always show the um, the um, Allen Iverson clip uh, where he's talking about practice. He's like, "Come on, man, we're talking about practice. You're talking about practice. Like, I, you know, um, I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and you're talking about practice. And it it can be a joke, except that he he's going on about practice, right? Because of of course he would he had trouble with the with the nba as much as they extracted from him they also tried to like crush him in some ways but but what's so powerful to me and and you can you can uh look up on youtube anybody who's who doesn't know the clip i'm talking about i think he says practice like 29 times at least in the edited clip but he had lost a friend a very good friend not long before that and so it was really a moment of grief and to watch him be in that, like that, that that's what the repetition was. It was almost like ablutions, right? Or it's about all the other ways that we, we uh, ritualize how to move through grief, you know? Like for us, we, we dunked under the river four times, but it's four times and, you know, move around the coffin four times. Like, I mean, the, everything has a, a, a kind of repetition. And so I think a lot about that, about, yeah, about, you know, about what that means to put the body through repetition and also like that, that the body somehow becomes multiple in some ways, you know, like, especially when you're out on the court and when you're a kid, like you could, you know, I've seen my little brothers like throw, throw the ball up and now my nieces and nephews, but like throw the ball up and run and catch it and touchdown. Like they're the quarterback and the receiver, you know? And so th there's such an imagination in sport and athletics. And I feel so lucky because I really do think they're very like, futuristically momentous uh makings of the imagination um but yeah again super long answer but i appreciate the question because it reminded me of of those kids out there in the street just i mean going at it and like you know and winning like they were win they win out there and and there's no ball so it's kind of amazing that's uh, that's such a yeah. I think there's a lot of people in the in the comment queue who are saying, "Please, please write that poem." Um, yeah, it might be best just left like that. <laughs> I know it's 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 so hard when you you, you see something that's. I, I, it highlights what a poem is trying to do, which is sometimes to to meet the the beauty and perfectness of the world. Um, you know, the, there's a question in the comment um, queue about your poem Wolf OR7, uh, which is about so much more than the wolf. Um, and uh, the question is, had, had you done um, much learning about that particular uh, wolf OR93 um, uh, before writing the poem? And how do you get into something like that versus something, you know, like um, like the poem that we're, you're slightly touching when we were just talking, which is, you know, the, the top 10 reasons why Indians are good at basketball, which is, has one of my favorite, you know, appearances in a poem of a skyhook. <laughs> <laughs> I think the skyhook thing is true. <laughs> Although I've, I've met so many natives who are like, we, we, we make skyhooks. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, before our seven, I was, I mean, I wouldn't say I was obsessed with it, but I mean, it was a story and it was such an interesting story, a, a complex and problematic story, because it was the story was uh, the story was told through its collar, 
you know, that we could track it and the, the, watching this line. And then, I mean, there's still, I still don't know how I feel about this, but, but then like when it found a mate, you know, they set up all these trail cameras and things and like, just how terrible, right? Like the, the paparazzi, these biologist paparazzi or something. But I mean, and now they're protected. My partner was just telling me that some protections passed. Um, I haven't been on the news very much intentionally, but um, except seeing if Ben Simmons was getting traded or not. That's the one thing I checked on for the, I mean, <laughs> fine, now I can rest finally that, that Ben Simmons finally fucking got traded. I was like, what, when is this gonna happen? Pardon my language. Um, but but yeah, with that, with the with the Wolf OR7, I was thinking a lot about it. And I was thinking so much about, um, you know, because this happens to mountain lions, like Marfa, for example, is, you know, uh, it even happens in my desert with coyotes. And, and they're, they're of such importance to our stories. But, you know, they kill the sheep. And so they put bounties on them, you know, and they and they dispose of them in such terrible ways. And I, I don't need to be gruesome i think we're in a gruesome enough time but they they just don't treat their bodies as if they were lives um but yeah this wolf i mean and also that that it that i just think like it's it's strange to me because like i i feel like sometimes like the world is too hard like you know and i have as down a moment i think as but but it's almost as if like I've been pitted against this country in such a way that I will fight through a day no matter what for better and worse. Right. Like, I think I've had to teach myself you can break a little bit like it's OK to break and you probably should because nothing should withstand some of these things that happen. Right. But I think about like just like the because I think we think of life as living, but but it, it's something else and the and and the way it moves and the way it demands uh yeah i, I mean i can't exp i can't explain it but like that wolf what wh how far it traveled and and the desire it had you know and i talk i talk in a moment of like you know i i confuse instinct for desire you know and isn't that what it is like uh and I think this is what you're saying, right? Like, uh, to be alone, to be lonely or loneliness, like, uh, you know, who are we if not someone who is of something larger, right? Like, and this is very, very, very indigenous is like, my autonomy only matters in relationship to, to who is around me, you know, to a larger community or collective, which is why I think I landed in poetry. I think poetry as a practice is quite indigenous. Like it's a connector. It's, it's the, it's, it's, it's a reason why it's one of the oldest things we have, whether we called it poetry in our indigenous communities or not, uh, at least not, not in, in the, the, you know, the old days, but the first days, right. <laughs> um, but Are yeah, I th involved? that wolf was just something. Are you, are you still working on um, language preservation? Um, yeah, I um, right now we're working on songs. Uh, I'm working on songs with one of my elders. Uh, uh, and my teacher's name is Hubert. Um, and we're working on a 235 song cycle right now. And um, like really, really, really lucky. We have, I think, 77 songs left. Um, so I have a, there's a great guy who lives down in Tucson named David Finster, who I actually met in oh, Marfa, yeah. a filmmaker. Yeah, does works with PBS here. Uh, but he came down and helped me. And uh, it's just a really sweet, sweet person, generous, made my made my elder, Hub elder Hubert feel at home. But we're we're documenting them like in an archival sense, but also trying to create you know, the possibility of making some sort of documentary on it, I, you know, in Hubert's uh, 97, you know, and knows like he wants these songs out. Um, but so I'm still, I'm still doing that work. And it's just been so hard with COVID trying to be careful. And um, yeah, it just, uh, and in some ways it's, it reminds you of why we don't have the language to begin with, you know, because there have been so many uh, I mean, we wouldn't have called them pandemics at the time, but things that, 
that moved through our res. So it's been, we've had a really hard time at home and you know, they're, yeah, I feel like right now I'm just finally, you know, and I know there are some of you out there probably in similar situations where just like coming up out of like loss and like learning to carry it now versus sitting in it only, or maybe sometimes still finding myself sitting in it, but also like learning to move into it. Um, but yeah, so that work has been slowed a little bit, but uh, in March, we're going back out. We're going to try to finish those songs. So it'll be the first time that we've heard them all together. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, Pretty incredible. I, I, you know, I, I read this book when it came out and I, you know, obviously read it again recently. Um, and then before we talked today, uh, and it, it feels different reading it now after two years of the pandemic, um, you know, because I think everyone has different cycles, whether you've um, been indoors or not, or locked down or sick or not, or lost people or not. And I feel like we're surfacing out of some, some different periods. Um, and a book like this makes that, um, well, it makes it more possible in a sense, because it, it puts us back into the body um, just by virtue of, of what you're asking of us. Um, speaking of which, uh, I should put you back into your night. I heard a um, drag racer going in the background. Um, it's <laughs> yeah. 908. Um, the Fast and the Furious is coming to, to yeah. the neighborhood. Um, it's probably one of my students. For <laughs> <laughs> Somehow when, when I hear that sound, I've, I've, I'm happy. Like for me, like a, a, someone like really opening up the fourth barrel on a carburetor from a, from a far distance yeah. is like a train whistle guitar. It's like a, it's like one of the best sounds ever. Yeah, um, I, I saw a car the other day with glass packs, which I, I mean, I had only seen those things at home and I was like, wow, I didn't know they still had those, but also that some young kid put glass packs on. It was like a, a Nova. <laughs> was incredible. It was the loudest thing, but uh, yeah, surprisingly beautiful and joyous at the same time. As Novas can be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they oh. knew when they named it, they were onto something. <laughs> oh, well, um, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I think at this point, David's going to come back on and tell you where to go um, to uh, send this link on to other people. Um, Natalie, you know. Gracias, just, John. Always. Yeah. I always look forward to the next time I get to run into you. So yeah, same. <laughs>